Minister Lavrov, thank you for doing this. Um, do you believe the United States and Russia are at war with each other right now? I wouldn't say so. And uh, in any case, this is not what we want. Uh, we would like to have normal relations with all our neighbors, of course, but generally with all countries or not, especially with the great country like the United States. Uh, President Putin repeatedly expressed his respect for the American people, for the American history, for the American achievements in the world. And uh, we don't see any, any reason why Russia and the United States cannot cooperate for the sake of the universe. But the United States is funding a conflict that you're involved in, of course, and now is allowing attacks on, on Russia itself. So that doesn't constitute war? Uh, well, uh, we officially are not at war. But what is going on uh, in Ukraine uh, is the, some people call it hybrid war. Uh, I would call it hybrid war as well. Uh, but it is obvious that the Ukrainians would not be able to do what they're doing with long-range modern weapons without direct participation of the American servicemen. And this is, this is, uh, this is dangerous, no doubt about this. We don't want to aggravate the situation, but since uh, Atakams and other uh, long-range weapons are being used against uh, mainland Russia, uh, as it were. Uh, we are sending signals, and we hope that the last one, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the signal with the new weapon system called the Reshnik, yes, uh, was uh, taken seriously. Uh, however, we also know that some uh, officials in the Pentagon and another places, including NATO, they started saying in the last few days uh, something like, well, NATO is a defensive alliance, but sometimes you can strike first because the attack is the best defense. Uh, some others in Stratcom, I think, uh, Buchanan is his name, uh, rep representative of Stratcom, he said something which allows for uh, an eventuality of exchange of limited nuclear strikes. Uh, and this kind of uh, threats are really worrying, because if they are following the logic, which some uh, Westerners have been pronouncing lately, that, well, don't believe that Russia has red lines, they announce their red lines, these red lines are being moved again and again and again, this is a very serious mistake. That's what I'm, I, I would like to say in response to this question. It is not us who started the war. Putin repeatedly said that we started the operation in order to end the war, which Kyiv regime uh, was conducting against its, its own people in the, in the parts of Donbass. Uh, and uh, just in his latest statement, the president uh, clearly indicated that we are ready for any eventuality, but we strongly prefer peaceful solution through negotiations on the basis of respecting legitimate security interests of Russia and on the basis of respecting the people uh, who live in Ukraine, uh, who still live in Ukraine being Russians, and their basic human rights, language rights, religious rights have been exterminated by a series of legislation passed by the Ukrainian parliament and they started long before the special military operation. Since uh, 2017, legislation was passed prohibiting Russian education in Russian, prohibiting Russian media operating in Ukraine, then prohibiting Ukrainian media working in Russian language. And the latest, of course, there were also, also steps to cancel any cultural uh, events in Russian. Russian books were thrown out of libraries and 
uh, exterminated. And the latest was the uh, law prohibiting canonic uh, Orthodox Church, Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, while, and you know, it's very interesting when uh, <clears throat> people in the West say we want this conflict to be resolved on the basis of the UN Charter and respect for territorial integrity of Ukraine, Russia must withdraw. Uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations says similar things. Uh, recently, his representative repeated that the conflict must be resolved on the basis of international law, UN Charter, General Assembly resolutions, while respecting territorial integrity of Ukraine. It's a misnomer, because if you want to respect the United Nations Charter, you have to respect it in its entirety. And the United Nations Charter, among other things, says that all countries must respect equality uh, of states and the right of people for self-determination. And they also mentioned the United Nations General Assembly resolutions. And this is, uh, this is clear that what, what they mean is the uh, series of resolutions uh, which they passed after the beginning of the special military operation and which demand condemnation of Russia. Uh, Russia get out of Ukraine territory uh, in 1991 borders. But there are other United Nations General Assembly resolutions which were not voted, but which were consensual. Uh, and among them is a declaration uh, on principles of relations between states on the basis of the Charter. And uh, it clearly says, by consensus, everybody must respect territorial integrity of states whose governments respect the right of people for self-determination. And because of that, represent the entire population living on right. a given territory. To argue that the people who came uh, to power through military coup d'etat in February 2014 represented Crimeans or the citizens of uh, Eastern and Southern Ukraine is absolutely useless. It is obvious that Crimeans rejected the coup. They said, leave us alone. We don't want to have anything with you. So did Donbas, Crimeans held referendum, and they rejoined Russia. Uh, Donbas was declared by the Putschists who came to power a terrorist group. Uh, they were shelled, attacked by artillery. Uh, the war started, which was stopped in February 2015. And the Minsk agreements were signed, and we were very sincerely interested in closing this this drama by seeing Minsk agreements implemented fully. Uh, it was sabotaged by the government uh, which was uh, established after the coup d'etat in Ukraine. There was a demand that they enter into a direct dialogue with the people who did not accept the coup. Uh, there was a demand that they promote economic relations with that part of Ukraine and so on and so forth. None of this was done. Uh, the people in Kyiv were saying we, can, we would never talk to them directly. Uh, and this is uh, in spite of the fact that the demand to, to talk to them directly was endorsed by the Security Council. And they said they are terrorists, we would be, you know, fighting them and uh, they would be uh, dying in cellars because we are stronger. Uh, <clears throat> had the coup in February 2014, uh, had it not happened, and had the deal which was reached the day before between the then president and the opposition implemented, Ukraine would have stayed one piece by now with Crimea in it. It's absolutely clear. They did not deliver on the deal. Instead, they staged the coup. The deal, by the way, uh, provided for creation of a government of national unity in February 2014 and holding early, early elections, which the then president would, 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 would have lost 
everybody knew that. But they were impatient and they took the government buildings next morning. They went to this Maidan Square and announced that they created the government of the winners. Compare the government of national unity to prepare for elections and the government of the winners. How can the people whom they, in their view, defeated, how can they pretend that they uh, respect the, the, the authorities in Kyiv? You know, the right for self-determination is the international legal basis for decolonization process, which took place in Africa uh, on the basis of uh, this charter principle, right for self-determination. The people in the colonies, they never treated the uh, colonial powers, colonial masters, as somebody who represent them, as somebody whom they want to see uh, in the, in the uh, structures which govern those lands. By the same token, the people in East and South of Ukraine, uh, people in Donbas and Novorossiya, they don't consider the Zelensky regime as somebody, as something which represents their interests. How can they, when their culture, their language, their traditions, their religion, all this was, was prohibited. Yes. And the last point is that <clears throat> if we speak about the UN Charter, resolutions, international law, the very first article of the UN Charter, which the West never, never recalls in the Ukrainian context, says respect human rights of everybody, irrespective of race, gender, language or religion. Take any conflict. The United States, uh, UK, Brussels, they would interfere saying, oh, human rights have been grossly violated. We must restore the human rights in such and such territory. On Ukraine, never, ever they mumbled the words human rights. Seeing these human rights for the Russian uh, and Russian-speaking population being totally exterminated by, by law. So when people say, let's resolve the conflict on the basis of the Charter, yes. But don't forget that the Charter is not only about territorial integrity, and territorial integrity must be respected only if the governments are legitimate and if they respect the right of their own people.